So I'm here today to talk about the system. Now, what do I mean when I say the system? I'm generally referring to two things. The first is the sort of rules of the global economic game. The extent to which goods are you know, uh, taxed or put, put on tariffs if they cross borders. The extent to which capital can move effortlessly across borders. The degree to which intellectual property is enforced. The degree to which banks are regulated and so forth. And the second thing I'm referring to when I talk about the system is essentially the sort of array of both international and national institutions that write regulate, monitor, and enforce those rules. And those can range from international treaty regimes that you've probably heard of, like the International Monetary Fund or the World Trade Organization, to more informal groupings like the G20 finance ministers or the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Now, in general, the sort of conventional wisdom about global economic governance, even before 2008, resembled a joke that Woody Allen told at the very beginning of Annie Hall. And at that joke, he talked about two women who were in a resort in the Catskills. And one of them said to the other, you know, the food here really isn't that good. And the woman, other woman responded, I know, and such small portions, too. <laughs> and in some ways, that's the basic attitude that people have about global economic governance. The outputs are awful. They taste bad. You know, if you're on the left that you think, you know, all this stuff is just producing, you know, untrammeled free market capitalism. And if you're on the right, you believe that the UN secretly has black helicopters just waiting to strip our sovereignty. And the problem is that both sides also agree they don't do enough. And to be fair, I think prior to 2008, this criticism was valid. Global economic governance has had a lot of flaws. There was paralysis. One of the reasons we had the 2008 financial crisis was a buildup in macroeconomic imbalances. The Chinese were basically saving way too much and the United States was spending way too much. Part of this was because the renminbi was generally thought to be undervalued. The natural place this should have come up was the International Monetary Fund. But anytime someone tried to bring up this conversation to the executive board, the Chinese member would basically veto it. So there was no proper conversation. And if there wasn't paralysis, there was sclerosis. We are now in year 14 of the Doha round of world trade talks. And one of the depressing things about each round of global trade talks in the history of the GATT and the WTO is that each round has taken much longer than the previous one. And frankly, there's no end in sight with respect to the Doha round. And there's a general fear that the WTO is soon to be irrelevant. If there wasn't paralysis or sclerosis, there was outright stupidity. And so for example, here you can think about the Basel II banking standards. Basel II had the bright idea that what we should do is trust financial institutions to calculate the value of their collateral that they held when they were going to loan out money. Um, not beginning to think that maybe those banks might actually overvalue those assets if they were in the middle of an asset bubble. And then if you didn't have those three, you finally had offensiveness. So for example, one of the principal sort of informal fora before the 2008 financial crisis was the G8. And it began to dawn on members of the G8 that you know, there were these other countries out there like China and India and maybe they were pretty important and they should be brought in. So someone came up with a bright idea of having an opening dinner before the G8 summit where you would invite the leaders of China or India or Mexico or what have you and then they would talk and then they'd be sent away and then the actual summit would take place. Which kind of reminds me of like you know, when I would go to Thanksgiving dinner as a child and I was relegated to the kiddie table. That fortunately ended when I turned 40. And there were genuine reasons to believe that global economic governance was in trouble even prior to 2008. And then 2008 was without question the worst year in global economic history for at least the last century. Now people often say, well, what about the Great Depression? Well, as the charts up there show, if you take a look at both in terms of trade flows and in terms of industrial output, the red line shows what happened from the beginning of 2008 onward. The blue line shows what happened at the beginning of 1929 onward. In the first 12 months of the 2008 financial crisis, both trade and industrial output shrank more than they did at the start of the Great Depression. So in fact, 2008 was a far bigger shock than what happened in 1929. And part of the problem is, is that there are no shortage of books that have been published since 2008, basically arguing that the system has failed, that things are you know, really broken, that basically we live in a bad, horrible place. Really, it took me five minutes to find this on Amazon.com. Now, why is that? Well, they'll generally offer one of two reasons. The first is, is that we're in the middle of a power transition, and that's scary. That much like the interwar period where the United States was supplanting Great Britain, we're now in a period where China is supplanting the United States. And we're in a situation where perhaps the United States is willing but unable to supply global public goods, 
whereas China is able but unwilling to do so. And a more recent, more modern argument says that, frankly, power ain't what it used to be. That, you know, let's face it, someone like Edward Snowden or someone like Bill Gates has more power than, let's say, President Obama or the President of the European Central Bank. And if you combine those two things, power transition and power diffusion, you wind up in a world of entropy or chaos or zombies or what have you. So basically, the book that came out last year that I wrote called The System Work argues that the last three minutes that I, you know, whatever I've said is just flat out wrong. Okay, that in fact, contrary to a lot of conventional wisdom and contrary to my own expectations in the fall of 2008, the system works surprisingly well. You know, or let me put it this way, I'm Jewish. The informal Jewish title of my book would be, it could have been so much worse. <laughs> so how can we tell that, all right? The book looks at three different levels. All right, the first is what actually happened to the global economy after the 2008 financial crisis in terms of outcomes and compares it to previous instances where there's been a serious financial crisis at the epicenter of the global economy. I also look at policy outputs. Essentially, did governments and did international institutions do what you would have wanted them to have done in the midst of that kind of crisis? And finally, I also look at policy operations the extent to which these institutions reformed themselves and rewrote their rules as a way to at least mitigate the chances that 2008 would happen again. So, in terms of outcomes, again, these are those same charts that you saw before, but now we're looking at four years rather than one year. And as you can see, the global economy rebounded surprisingly quickly compared to the last time you actually had a global financial crisis at the center of the global economy, which is in fact 1929. After four years of 2008, the global economy was both larger in terms of industrial output and in terms of trade. They both recovered far more quickly than would have been predicted by sort of standard macroeconomic models given the presence of the financial crisis. And furthermore, you can say, well, okay, Dresner, you know, I've read that Piketty book. Maybe it's all, you know, going to the 1%. Not so much. This is the UN Human Development Index that sort of shows what happens in terms of quality of life among the poorest of the poor. And it turns out that, interestingly enough, in the last decade, despite the 2008 financial crisis, there's been a greater amount of poverty reduction than there had been during the boom times in the 1990s. Part of that is because the system actually worked. Generally speaking, borders stayed open. And so as a result, what had been a serious financial crisis did not metastasize into a depression. In terms of outputs, we can look at things like average tariff rates. And again, one of the surprising things is, ordinarily, when economies go south, you expect an initial automatic protectionist response. That doesn't happen in terms of tariff levels. These are the sort of various tariff levels of the G20 economies, which are the major economies in the world. Well, what about non-tariff barriers? Non-tariff barriers did bump up slightly, but that bump didn't last long, and it got to the point where, by 2011, the WTO was recording the lowest level of non-tariff barriers in the WTO's history, which is in and of itself rather remarkable. And what about, you know, sort of the extent to which you can talk about globalization? You know, this is the Swiss Economic Institute's index of globalization that measures things like tourism, you know, cross-border tourism, cross-border trade, cross-border investment, internet traffic, and so forth. The absolute worst thing you can say post-2008 is that essentially the pace of globalization slowed somewhat. If that's the most damning indictment you can make of what happened after 2008, I would argue that the system worked surprisingly well. Now, the question is, why did the system work? Well, I've only got a minute left, and so I'm not really going to get into it that much. But essentially, what I can tell you is, is that the sort of bread and butter of international relations theory is power and interest in ideas. And essentially, in terms of power, people radically underestimated the persistent hegemonic power of the United States and its ability to keep the rules of the game relatively open. In terms of interests, by and large, people underestimated the way in which global supply chains created vested interests across the globe in maintaining open trade borders and also in maintaining open capital accounts. And then finally, in terms of ideas, the most surprising thing is that by and large, the Washington Consensus sort of set of ideas did not get discredited after 2008. This in and of itself was the most surprising thing, that China, which could have been the country that would have been the biggest challenger to the United States in terms of providing an alternative set of ideas, actually acted like a responsible stakeholder. And so for evidence of this in terms of global economic output, as we can see, the green line, the chartreuse line that you see up there shows China's share of global economic output. China, without question, has risen in power. But that said, people overestimated the extent to which the United States and the European Union actually declined. 
Combined, the two of them actually had a pretty stable set of preferences, and those stable set of preferences mattered. So in closing, I just want to say I'm completely petrified when I make this argument, and here's why. The guy on the left is a man named John Mearsheimer. John Mearsheimer had the audacity to argue that essentially Europe was going to go back to war after the end of the Cold War, that the United States and China are inevitably going to have a conflict. Uh, Mearsheimer has been wrong about a lot of things, but he is nonetheless venerated as a great international relations scholar. And the reason is, is because he's pessimistic. And pessimism sells. If you predict that the world is going to end and it doesn't, you're just being prudent or cautious. Or in fact, even better yet, the world didn't end because you warned everyone that it was going to end. <laughs> the guy on the right is Frank Fukuyama. Frank Fukuyama argued back in 1989 that history had ended. And that we were now you know, in a situation where everyone was going to acknowledge that liberal free market democracy was the best system out there. You cannot get a PhD in international relations now without at least having one sentence snarking on Fukuyama. <laughs> and in general, optimism, to be optimistic and then to be proven wrong is the worst thing that can happen to one's reputation. So I hope you come away knowing that I will hopefully be right. But if I'm wrong, you're definitely going to remember that. And you're going to make a lot of fun of me to your friends. <laughs> Thank you. And I'd be happy to take some questions.